Okay, let's start. Welcome, everyone. Um, this is the Vega seminar number five. Uh, thank you all for joining today uh, on this live seminar. My name is Simon Rue. I lead the viral genomics group at JGI. And really, on behalf of all the Vega co organizer, I'm very, very happy to welcome to this five and um, one before last seminar of this Vega 2021 series. Uh, this is one that should be very, very interesting. Um, I'm really excited actually about this one. We have you know, moved across describing the diversity of viruses, looking at all kinds of different viruses. And now we are try starting to dive down and more into like molecular mechanisms and really the way viruses and hosts interact. So plenty of cool science here. Uh, should be really a fun seminar. Um, a few quick words in terms of logistics. Um, we are here in the webinar portion of this, uh, of this seminar. We'll have two main talks today, interspersed with uh, one series of flash talks. And then following this, we will have a separate link to a breakout session where you as an attendee will be able to um, chat and discuss directly with speakers, both main speakers and flash talk speakers. During this webinar part, um, we have not activated the chat, but you can ask questions through the Q&A. And at the end of each of the main talk, we will uh, select and, and ask, um, some of this Q&A, as many as we can, you know, time permitting. If we can't get to your question, uh, they will be addressed either um, during the webinar uh, by writing, or they will be addressed in the breakout session. Um, I think that's all the information I needed to share here. And so without further delay, I will hand it over to Emily Ilofadros, who will be the chair for this session. Great. Thanks, Simon, and welcome, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Odd Bernhunt. Uh, Odd is a scientist at um, the INSERM, which is the French National Institute of Health and Medical Research, or effectively the French NIH. Um, her work is uh, quite exciting looking at uh, the interaction of bacteria and their virus and phages. Um, she also is very active in diversity, um, equity, and inclusion um, in the sciences. So I encourage you to um, uh, look more um, at her work. Um, and her talk today will be uh, titled Conservation of Antiviral Immunity in Prokaryotes and Eukaryotes. So without further ado, Ode. Hi everyone, so I will share my screen. So, uh, so first, really thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to talk in the US. I think it's uh, the first time I, I talk about this, uh, this work for, for a year in the US. And uh, so I'm, I'm gonna present you uh, the work I did during my postdoc in the Weizmann Institute of Science in, in the lab of Rotem Sorek that I guess a, a lot of you know. And now I uh, moved back to, uh, to Paris uh, where I'm originally from uh, to, uh, to keep working on these very exciting topics. So, uh, Let's just start by saying that uh, all uh, cells, eukaryotic and prokaryotic, face the threat of viral infections. And the, the viruses of bacteria, bacteriophages, as you can see on the right, uh, kind of follow uh, similar types of dynamics with the host as other types of, uh, of viruses and hosts. And one of the major, I would say, trend is the arms race. The notion of the arms race is that uh, when a phage infects uh, a bacteria, the bacteria in, in somehow it will lead to the development of anti-phage system. And what we observe is that phages are able uh, in some way to overcome these systems, which leads to the development of other system. And this arms race is really central to, uh, I would say the, the, the trends of uh, viral and host dynamics. And it leads to a diversification of immune systems. And one of the consequences of this diversification is that when we look at different organisms, and by different organisms, I mean across domains of life, so uh, plants, animals, and uh, prokaryotes or, or bacteria, we won't find the same type of antiviral systems. In bacteria, we'll find uh, mostly restriction modification and CRISPR-Cas systems, while in plant, uh, we could find NLR and or RNA interference, and in uh, animals, for example, interferon-stimulated genes. And uh, for example, we cannot find restriction modification or CRISPR-Cas in plants or uh, in, uh, in, in animals, and this is partly due to the fact of the arms race in the diversification I've mentioned. And uh, so this was kind of the, the picture we've been having so that pretty much prokaryotic immunity and eukaryotic immunity are just extremely different things. 
And this trend is actually changing. This, this big paradigm is evolving. And the reason why that there was a drastic shift in uh, the field of uh, what we can call prokaryotic immunity is that we went on from thinking that the bacterial immune systems were CRISPR-Cas, uh, restriction modification and uh, uh, some very specific mechanisms of abortive infection to a whole new world of, uh, of, of systems that uh, is, is still booming. And, uh, and the reasons for this explosion of diversity is a very specific observation that was made uh, initially by Kira Makarova and Eugene Kunin, and that is that bacterial defense system cluster together in genomes in so-called defense islands. And this observation was used in a landmark paper that really completely changed the field. Uh, so that was uh, pretty much uh, led uh, by uh, the Soric Lab and by Shani Doran in the lab. And, uh, and so it started from this defense island. So what we can see is that this defense island here, each, each line that I will show is a genome and each gene is a rectangle. And if they are colored the same way, they belong to the same system. So we see here that those defense systems, they do cluster together. We have RM for a modification, CRISPR Cas and Brex. And if we now look in other genomes, well, we do have again this association of defense systems. But in the middle, you have genes that I did not color that are gray, and those gray genes are actually genes for which the function is unknown. And the hypothesis between the, behind the paper that I was mentioning is that these gray genes are actually also defense system. And so this was explored through a systematic manner in 2018, and uh, pretty much uh, these gray genes were took as systems and cloned in model bacteria and experimentally validated. And this paper led to the discovery of a nine novel family of defense systems, and also by introducing this method, which was later refined by, by the lab, but also by other people uh, like uh, Gao and colleagues, uh, really led uh, the field of, of defense systems in, in a new world. And one of the major discoveries that stemmed out of all these novel bacterial systems is that actually there are systems that seem to be at least partly conserved between prokaryotic and eukaryotic immunity. And uh, uh, an example from the 2018 paper is the example of Toeris, which has tier domains, and tier have been known to be very involved in both plant and human immunity. And I encourage you to go check out a wonderful paper by a gal, a friend of mine, who uh, deciphered recently the mechanism and really illustrates the link between plant and bacterial immunity. There was a second example, which is uh, the origin of the C-gasting pathway, which is uh, the bacterial immune system CBAS. And finally, not through defense island, but through other uh, methods, there was uh, the argonaut that also showed that there is some conservation between the system. And so my postdoc re revolved around that teams, like are these conservation just trace traces of, of lost things, or are there actually more example of this type of conservations between prokaryotic and eukaryotic community? And I will tell you uh, two stories, so in a quite short time, and you will see that they will illustrate different aspects of what we can get out of this conservation. The first one will be more about how we can use knowledge from other type of immunity, and namely plant immunity, to decipher mechanisms that are novel to prokaryotic immunity. And the second story will be really a full, I would say, conservation from the sequence to the mechanism and what type of application it leads to. So the first story is about retrons, and uh, this is a published story, so you can uh, find it online for more experimental details. It was done in collaboration with two fantastic scientists, Adi Milman and Abigail Stokara-Vichail. And uh, at the same time as this uh, discovery came out, there are also two fantastic papers that uh, I uh, encourage you to read that are presented by your archive from the NASA Stipas Labs led by uh, Jacob Bobodis. So uh, what are retrons? So retrons are uh, very cool genetic elements that were discovered in the 80s because they were pretty much running a DNA gel and there was a band that was weird and uh, <laughs> different from the total uh, genome band. And from this band of uh, satellite DNA, um, the uh, people discovered that uh, the, the existence of retrons. And a retron is defined by two things, the retron type reverse transcriptase, so a reverse transcriptase and a non-coding DNA. And this non-coding uh, uh, non-coding RNA, sorry. And so what happens is that the non-coding RNA uh, takes a very specific structure in transcribe, and from this very structured RNA, the reverse trans 
cryptase start reverse transcribing from a specific guanosine and makes cDNA. And this leads to the existence of an msDNA, which is an RNA-DNA hybrid. And so while this is a beautiful uh, characterization at the biochemistry level, and it was detailed for 16 uh, types of retrons, uh, there was absolutely no idea what these elements were uh, used for uh, by bacteria. And these elements were even used as tools in, uh, let's say, genome engineering experiments. But still, despite the biochemical work, uh, no function of retrons. And how did we come to this? Well, as, I, as you know, maybe the, the lab I was a part of is involved in finding novel defense systems. And so we were looking at this novel defense system. It was uh, nice, had everything we liked. So we, sit, uh, we, we, we basically had this uh, uh, suspicion towards the defense system because it stands next to other defense systems. And pretty much it was composed of two genes, a reverse transcriptase and an endonuclease. So we, we did what we do, we tested it. So we cloned it in E. coli. And what you see is a plaque assay, so a loan of bacteria and on top of it, plaques. So when you have clear plaques, it means the phages are able to infect. And here, when you have the system in the cell, you see that uh, you have less plaques. So the phages are not able to infect well. This is a defense phenotype. And one thing that was striking when we looked at this two gene system is that every time we were looking at it, there was an inter regions between these two genes. And this was striking because usually defense systems comes at very tight operon. And so the hypothesis was then that maybe within this intergenic region, there was something that was important, and that is to say an encoding RNA. So what we did was just to, to sequence the RNA present in the cells encoding the system. And what we could see is that here, just between the two genes, we could actually detect, uh, this is a number of mapped reads uh, over the genomes. We can detect a lot of reads, which are the sign of the presence of the non-coding RNA. And following a, a few uh, bioinformatics analysis on the structures of this non-coding RNA, we were able to conclude that within these defense systems, we had a retron, which is a reverse transcriptase and the non-coding RNA. So we had this novel defense system that encodes a retron. And through experiments I'm not showing, we were able to show that the retron properties are necessary for defense, but you also need the additional uh, gene, the endonuclease, to have defense. The retron is not sufficient. And so starting from this, we have, okay, maybe, you know, it's just one thing that you have a defense system with a retron, but maybe actually this is a function of retrons. Maybe they are all involved in antiviral activities. And so to test this, we went back to the known retrons. So we had 16 of them. And as I told you, the retrons are defined non-coding RNA and RT. But we knew from our experience with the novel system we had discovered that it came with an additional gene. And we thought that maybe the functional unit of the retrons is not only the RT and the non-coding RNA, but with additional genes. And we're able to find that for each of the retrons that were initially described, they were indeed part of families with additional genes that, that I call effector. And so we took these functional units, so the retron plus the additional genes, cloned them in E. coli, all of them except the last one, and uh, we uh, did the same thing, looked if they defended genes. And indeed, all of them, all the one we tested, as I said, last one we didn't test, gave defense against phages. And so uh, at this stage, uh, we also showed that they were functioning through an abortive infection mechanism. And you can see uh, experimental details in the paper. But what really caught our attention was what was triggering the retrons. And for this, what we did was uh, something called the escapee strategy, is that I told you that this is a defense phenotype because you see no plaques or less plaques. But if you're actually very careful, there is a plaque here that you can take and sequence the phage. And the hypothesis is that this phage was able to overcome the specific defense systems, namely EC48 in this case, the retron EC48. And when we sequence these phages, we did this with two phage, lambda and T7. And all the time, we kept getting mutation in the same genes. And very interestingly, these genes in lambda and T7 are different. One is called GAM. Uh, the other is called uh, 5.9. And they are very different, but both of them have the same function. They are RegBCD inhibitor. So what does that mean? What, what does have RegBCD have to do with anything? Well, uh, at this stage, uh, I have to tell you that RegBCD is involved in DNA repair, but also 
kind of acts as somehow a defense the same in the sense that it eats up uh, the incoming phage DNA. So to avoid this, because it's an exonuclease, phages encode reg BCD inhibitor uh, to have a successful infection. And so when we discovered that all these genes were reg BCD inhibitors, it made us uh, think of an hypothesis that exists in plant immunity and is called the guard hypothesis. And the guard hypothesis states that a way an immune system will recognize that a virus is infecting is not through detecting a structural protein or something specific to the virus, but it's by monitoring the modification of a host protein. Pretty much the guard protein will, will sit next to the host and when it's modified because a pathogen is coming, it will trigger an immune response. And so this is the, the hypothesis that we thought, meaning that the EC48 retron was guarding reg BCD and that when it's modified, that is to say inhibited by the, the phage inhibitors, it, uh, it uh, pretty much triggers the immune response. And the nice thing is that within uh, the, the, plant, uh, the plant immunity, they developed a lot of different experimental ways to test for this that we adapted and were able to test for this hypothesis by adapting these experimental, uh, these experimental uh, ways. And so I, I won't show you the, the results, but just the general mechanism, it ended up that indeed EC48 guards reg BCD and the current mechanism we have is that uh, it, uh, the, the retron part is guarding it. We, it's not fully, fully demonstrated, but this is a current hypothesis. The phage has come, it expresses reg BCD inhibitors. This is sent by the retrons and then activates the effectors, which leads to gross arrest. And so uh, that's what we have. And so in a nutshell, what, what we learned for this, so of course it was really cool to, uh, to, to solve this uh, 30 years old mystery. And there are still many, many questions to elucidate, whereas the detailed sensing mechanisms, the role of the MSDNA, uh, whereas other, what do other retrons uh, guard or sense, uh, this is still to discover. But it was super nice to, to kind of discover the existence of guardian systems in bacteria. And, and this is many aspects. First, because we have now methods and tools to discover more guardian systems. So may, maybe we can elucidate uh, other defense mechanism uh, uh, using this type of uh, experimental aspect we've been using. And second, the plant immune field has many, many kind of, of other developments based on the guard model, which is like the decoy model, the integrated decoy and everything. And so somehow we can also get inspired and try to see if these strategies also exist in the prokaryotic world. And it's uh, fascinating to kind of see this uh, evolutionary convergence in antiviral immunity across domains of life. So that was uh, the first story, and now I will uh, switch to, to something quite different, and I will talk about uh, viperins. So yeah, you know, only in elements with uh, very cool names, I, uh, that's my feeling. So this, again, this is the title of the paper, and uh, you, can, uh, you can find it online. So viperins, what are viperins? So viperin is a protein, an enzyme that was discovered uh, in humans to have an antiviral activity a couple of decades ago. And the mechanism of action of viperin was completely unknown until 2018. There were actually tons of hypotheses, but, uh, but uh, nothing uh, really concrete. And uh, well, uh, Gizzi and colleagues uh, from the Almo lab demonstrated a, a wonderful uh, mechanism. So the way it works is that viperase in an enzyme that catalyzes uh, the reaction going from CTP to a molecule called DDH CTP. And what it is is that viperin takes here the water molecule and pretty much leads to the formation of a double bond here. And this double bond is important because now the three prime OH group is missing. And this is very important because you need the three prime OH for the polymerization reaction, meaning that DDH-CTP is an RNA chain terminator. It means that when this nucleotide is incorporated in an RNA chain, no other nucleotide can be added afterwards. So it terminates the RNA. And so the, the way the mechanism works in human is that CTP makes, uh, is transformed into DDH-CTP by the viperin. And uh, this is incorporated into the viral RNA, which are prematurely terminated, leading to the antiviral activity. And when this paper came out, uh, we were reading it with, uh, with the colleagues from the SOEC lab and we thought, wow, be so amazing if this existed in bacteria. And so we did a blast. 
and <laughs> miraculously, there were hits <laughs> on this Viperin and very good hits. But of course, you know, it's not that you have hits that they are actually doing the same thing. So uh, what I'm showing you here is genomes and in red homologs of the human Viperin. And when we looked at the genetic context of these homologs of the human Viperin, you can already guess what we found, which is other defense systems. Meaning that for us, this was very suggestive that because of this defense context, the homologs of the human viperin in prokaryotes were also acting as antivirals. And so this context suggested antiviral activity. So uh, what we did was, of course, to try to test for it. Uh, these uh, these uh, prokaryotic viperins, or as I call them, PVIPs, uh, come from very diverse bacteria. And so we, we cloned them under an inducible promoter in E. coli. What I'm showing you here is an infection curve with the OD on the y-axis and the, the time. This is a bacteria without viperin, it's growing well. I'm adding phages, the population collapses. This is a phage infection. I am now showing you a viperin without phages, it grows as a control. I'm adding the phage and voila, it's so wonderful. It's surviving the phage infection. So this uh, experiment allowed us to demonstrate that in uh, prokaryote, viperins also serve as antiviral, uh, also have an anti-phage activity. And so at this stage, we were super interested into like knowing a bit more about the Viperin family in general. And so what we did was to take all the homologs we found. It's actually a very rare protein, only 218 PVIPs in uh, something like 60,000 genomes. And we built a phylogenetic tree. And uh, the main thing is that this is a very rare protein, but it's super widespread. We find archaea, cyanobacteria, spirochetes, firmicute protobacteria. And for us, this pointed to a quite ancient origin of, uh, of this gene. And one thing we're particularly interested in was the, uh, the, the place of the eukaryotes in this tree. And they are actually here. So several uh, eukaryotic sequence spanning from uh, unicellular organism, uh, fungi uh, to uh, humans and animals, they all cluster in one monophyletic clade that stems out of a PV clade, which told us that uh, this is uh, this super important human uh, immune gene actually uh, found its origin in uh, uh, antiphage uh, defense gene. And besides this, I think it's fascinating to see here that there is a huge diversity in the prokaryotic world uh, in the number of version of uh, the type of um, of a version of this protein that exists. And this diversity could also lead to the question, well, maybe only some of the proteins are antiviral. Maybe the other are doing something else. And so we ask, are all PVIPs antiviral? And so we sampled the tree and took 60 homologs pretty around the tree from each of the clade. And we put them in the same setup that I showed you in E. coli and tested them. And out of them, 28 had antiphage activity. And for us, that was huge because they come from very, very real bug and they're still able to work in E. coli and protect against an E. coli phage. And moreover, they are really span in all the clades. It's not concentrated in wild clade, which really convinced us that uh, pretty much the old viperin family is antiviral. And one thing, uh, was an experiment that uh, started more as a fun experiment, but really uh, served its purpose, was to try if the human viperin would work in E. coli. And actually it does. <laughs> so I have an experiment where uh, this human gene protects the E. coli phage. And this was actually essential to an understanding because if a human gene is able to work, it kind of, of uh, in a similar way as the other PVIPs, it was kind of telling us that the mechanism was conserved. And we know the mechanism with the human viper and it produces this GDH CTP. The main question we have was, okay, so do the other also produce a molecule? And if they do produce the same molecule, uh, because we have all this diversity, do they produce the same or different type of molecules? And so that's, uh, that's uh, the next question we ask. Do they generate different types of molecules? And so for is this, we turn to mass spectrometry. So we took cells, grow them, and then we pellet them. And we only take the intracellular lysette where we expect to find the molecule and submit uh, uh, and take only the small fraction and submit it to, to LCMS for untargeted metabolomics. And I won't go into the, the details of these experiments, just show you the summary. Uh, but first, we're super excited because we didn't know if uh, it would work out to see these molecules in that manner. And the human viperin served as a wonderful positive control, and we're able to detect DDH-CTB. And actually, on the tree, right next to the human viperin, sits other types of viperin, such as PVP6 and PVP50, and both of them also produce DDH-CTB. 
but many other viperins didn't produce DDHCTP. But for us, we had in mind that maybe the sequence diversity was meaning a, a chemical diversity. So we checked for other types of DDH nucleotides, meaning not modifying CTP, but UTP or GTP. And indeed, these were producing UTP derivatives, so DDH UTP. And this one, DDH CTP. And uh, to uh, us being even more amazed by these wonderful PVIPs, we actually saw that several of them actually produce several DDH nucleotide at the same time. So very promising, and also kind of, of leading us to think that if you give them several types of, of artificial nucleotide, they could create, you know, these double bonds that really make a nucleotide into an, somehow an antiviral molecule. And so this experiment showed that prokaryotic viperin produced diverse antiviral molecules. And very interestingly, there were five uh, PVIPs for which we are not able to detect any of these three molecules, but still have a very strong antiviral activity. So this is a, a mystery to solve. So for us, the remaining uh, thing to, to check was do PVIPs protect, uh, how do they protect against uh, phages? And for this, we basically had the idea that it was working the same way as in humans. And for the sake of time, I won't go into the details of the experiment, but we are able to show that the mechanism is conserved between the human viperin and the PVIP. And that is to say that there, the viperins impact viral dependent RNA transcription. So pretty much the PVIP take modified nuclear, take uh, several uh, nucleotides or one, depending on them, will modify them to create these poisons, these DDH nucleotides that are incorporated in the phage RNA, which lead to the premature termination of the phage transcripts. And so it was quite interesting to see that this mechanism of, of, our, of RNA chain termination is conserved between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. But actually chain termination is already a mechanism that us humans have been using against viruses, and that is to say in a therapeutic manner. Many of the um, uh, diverse uh, 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 drugs that we have against viruses are actually chain terminators. And so this led us think that maybe all these uh, novel molecules that we discovered might lead in some way, maybe not in their natural form, but maybe in modified form to uh, novel antiviral drugs. And so uh, to, to conclude on this, uh, we, we really have this family uh, with an antiviral strategy with key concern between prokaryotes and eukaryotes with a very interesting feature in the prokaryotic world to have this wonderful diversity. And if we uh, take this even a step further, we can think as a wonderful discovery shown notably by, the, by Karen Maxwell and colleagues, there are other strategy of chemical defense. And uh, this kind of, of shows that maybe chemical defense is more widespread uh, than just viperins and uh, the molecules uh, dis uh, discovered uh, by the Maxwell lab to be antiphage. And if that is the case, maybe we can find in bacteria uh, novel types of antiviral molecules in uh, antiphage systems. And so they can be used as a repository for such molecules. And so uh, now just to kind of wrap up on this whole uh, conservation uh, idea, uh, I just wanted to kind of underline uh, what I call the power of comparative immunology and the interest of working about on immunology across domains of life is that we, we now went a lot from system present in humans to systems present in uh, bacteria. It led us, uh, the knowledge in humans or plants led us to new knowledge in bacteria. But there are many species like here, Emelina Huxley, uh, which is a very important uh, species uh, in the oceans that we don't know anything about the defense system while the, the viruses are super important for the cycle. So maybe we can now use bacterial systems to try look in some eukaryotes if we can find leads on how to explore this. A second aspect is that, as I said, for uh, the, the retrons really got inspired uh, by uh, the plant immunity. And maybe there are other concepts, such as a concept of interferon, that we can uh, actually uh, take and think about uh, uh, to prokaryotic systems. Uh, the third aspect is that uh, we saw within the viperin that for this type of conserved mechanisms, there are things in common that we can actually study in bacteria, and maybe then it will lead us to knowledge that is also valid for eukaryotes, such as in the viperin example, for example, uh, what makes a viral polymerase susceptible to these DDH nucleotides, which is a question that we can start answering in bacteria and might lead to new knowledge in, um, in, in eukaryotes. And finally, I think uh, the viperin was a great example to show that there are still uh, many things to discover and to mine prokaryotic diversity, notably with the example of maybe uh, novel uh, antiviral drugs that uh, we can discover in bacteria. 
And so uh, on this, I really want to uh, thank uh, May. Sorry, my... Uh... That's all right. We lost you for one moment, but on the last slide, so we can oh, it's okay. probably just reconvene on the thanks slide. Yeah, so that's what I, uh, and it is an important one. <laughs> yeah, I know. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so I uh, I want to finish by uh, thanking uh, everyone and uh, notably my uh, mentor, so Rotem Sorek, for being an absolutely fantastic uh, scientist to work with, extremely inspiring, super creative. And also super inspiring for the most wonderful team he created, which is the Sorek Lab, which is a truly, truly special place. And uh, and all my collaborators, uh, namely uh, Adi Milman, who really we work closely with, and Abigail, and uh, many other people that I uh, mentioned here on the slides, and the Weizmann Institute, which I highly recommend for anyone who wants to experiment what it is to do science in the best condition possible. And as I said, I am uh, now uh, back at Paris. So uh, if you are uh, in the area, uh, please uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was just fantastic. Um, really exciting work. Um, all right. For everybody, uh, if you could please um, add your questions to the Q&A. We have a couple questions that have already been added that I can um, ask. So uh, the first uh, two questions that came in are um, with uh, asking about the prokaryotic viperins. Um, so would the DDH molecules affect uh, bacterial health as well? And then also, is the viperin activity regulated at protein or the expression level? So regarding the first question, uh, we see that uh, the DDH nucleotides do not seem at the concentration we, we had in the, in the bacteria to impact bacterial growth. The bacteria are able to grow for really uh, most viperin than the ones that express the most, uh, uh, that produce the most DDH nucleotides. Uh, they, they are not uh, growing uh, in, a, in a, let's say in a, in a less gross manner. Uh, if you really overexpress it, at some point it starts to impact the growth of the bacteria, but like a lot of genes that you overexpress. Uh, what we think is that it seems not to be incorporated by the host polymerase, or at least maybe at, not at a rate that uh, makes it uh, toxic for the bacteria. And in the paper, you can see both growth, growth curves, but also CFU to, 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 to attest for uh, this non-toxicity. So it's one of the things that is super interesting is that somehow the cell versus non-self uh, discrimination uh, happens maybe at the polymerase level, meaning that the viral polymerase is taking these nucleotides while the host do not. And maybe this is due to the trade-off in the sense that, for example, the T7 polymerase used in this work, really the whole cycle of T7 is 17 minutes. So it's super, super fast. And so maybe there is a trade-off between the quality of nucleotides you will incorporate and how fast you are at transcribing something. Regarding the second question of the regulation of the PVIPs, it's an excellent uh, and fascinating question. However, I cannot answer for the reason that the whole study was done in a very heterologous host, meaning that they, the viperins are very rare and they are not in model organisms at all. So we had to just take the sequence and work in E. coli. What we uh, show uh, on the other side is that uh, for many cases, the viperins do not come alone, like in their native setup. Sometimes they come alone, but sometimes they come within system. So like this. And so within system, they have other genes such as uh, EK or encrine repeats and, and this. And we think that maybe within these systems, like for example, here, the encrine repeats is known to be involved in pattern recognition. So maybe this is a gene that will recognize uh, the, the phage and then uh, somehow leads to the expression of more PVIPs. Uh, but as the PVIP, uh, the DDH nucleotide production doesn't seem to be toxic to the bacteria, doesn't seem to be necessarily super, super regulated. Maybe a bit. We, we don't know because we don't have a good, uh, let's say, bacteria to work with in a natural setting on this system. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have a bunch of questions coming in. Um, so the next one is, uh, awesome talk. <laughs> um, do you think all or most uh, retrons are involved in antiviral defense specifically or are more generally used as sensors in regulation within the cell? 
So what I can say is that uh, all the retrons we tried, so all the retrons that had been described, we found them to be involved in antiviral defense. We haven't tested all the retrons in the world. There is another thing that I didn't show you that maybe I, I, I won't find it ever. <laughs> Uh, it's a, we have a phylogenetic tree of, based on the reverse transcriptase. And this phylogenetic tree kind of gives us major clades of retrons. And for this, we were able to calculate defense scores, meaning how much it is associated to other defense genes. And within these defense scores, most of the clades of RTs were having a quite high defense score, which makes us think that they are involved in antiviral defense. But I would say, a couple of clades seem to have a lower score. And this couple of clades also had retrons, which uh, uh, we basically um, didn't test because they are from bacteria that are very far away from E. coli. And so we are not able to, to test them. And these maybe are not involved in antiviral defense. But my feeling is like the, the, the function of retron is uh, uh, is antiviral defense and that maybe the same way as I don't know if you know, but for CRISPR-Cas systems, sometimes they are involved in other functions such as regulation. And there was some adaptation and uh, maybe this is also the case of retrons, but I cannot definitely know having not tested all the retrons in the world. Great, thank you. I think we might only have uh, time for a couple more questions, um, but let's let's move forward. So the the next question is a uh, fantastic talk, Odd. Thanks. You mentioned the anthracyclines as antiviral small molecules, but these gene clusters synthesizing these molecules did not appear in the 2018 Doran et al. paper. Do you have any insights why this is the case? Yes. I do. So uh, the way the, the, the Doron paper works is notably by looking at systems that will be widespread in a diversity of organisms and always within the same way. The fantastic work by, uh, by uh, Ken Maxwell and colleagues uh, shown that it was the case in streptomyces. And mostly all the systems for Doron and et al really require that you see this kind of clusters of, of genes uh, of like a small cluster, maybe three, four genes that you would see them in different places and in different environments. Whereas the kind of, of uh, molecules the, the, uh, that were discovered are notably forms what's called biosynthetic gene clusters, which are also much bigger and that we won't find in a, a, a wide diversity, I would say, of organism like uh, uh, maybe not Nicolai or, or, or Bacillus subtilis. So this is one of the, of the reasons. And I, I, I don't know uh, the exact genetics that produce these molecules, but my feeling is that they are produced by this kind of big pathways, and so it's not, uh, uh, it wouldn't be picked up in the in that same manner because also they also are not transferred horizontally the same manner. So uh, we didn't expect that we would find them that way. But of course, I think uh, several of us are interested into thinking of how genomically we could find. Uh, more of this type of pathways, or uh, it was also recently shown that uh, some antibiotics uh, produced by uh, by streptomyces uh, also act as uh, antiphage. So I think that there is a whole thing that will develop on chemical defense and finding these metabolites that are maybe only produced by a very small subset of bacteria, such as uh, some species of streptomyces that might act as a chemical defense. Great, thanks. Um, I think we'll have one last question and this had a, a plus up, so um, it, it jumped the line here. Um, so the, the last question is, have you looked at phages that don't encode their own polymerase? And would you expect they would also be inhibited by viperins? So uh, yes, we do. In the paper, there is uh, several plaque assay where, uh, and uh, work on phages where you will see we use the canonical and the favorite phage lambda. And lambda is known to not encode its own polymerase, which is a big difference with T7. And, uh, and the PVIPs defend against this fate. So how could that be? Well, we have several hypotheses and we, don't, uh, we didn't uh, validate any of these. The first thing is that um, it was shown in the literature that even a small change within uh, polymerase can make it much more sensitive to some nucleotides and notably to some terminators. And what happens is that when lambda comes in, uh, one of the first thing it does is to have a protein that will slightly modify the host polymerase so that it favors uh, lambda uh, genes. And so this could actually impact this. Another hypothesis is that lambda is also transcribed as a soup, as I think only two or three super long RNAs 
And so if you count that maybe the host polymerase is sensitive, but a very low dose, if only you get one chain terminator within this super long RNA, this would also have an effect. And the third hypothesis is that maybe there are also other antiviral mechanisms that are involved with the viperin that goes beyond the DH nucleotides. And you know, this could be possible because we didn't see if for several of the viperins any of the DDH nucleotides we are looking for. So maybe something else is happening. And uh, this is a, a question, of course, we are uh, interested in. Great. All right. Well, thank you. And I, I hate to cut off all of the great questions and discussions. Hopefully we can uh, follow up um, in the breakouts after. Um, so I wanted to hand it uh, back over to Simon for the flash talks. Thank you. Let me share my screen and we will get started on these flash talks. And the first one is Anna. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, hi everyone. So I'm Anna Dragos and I work as an assistant professor at the University of Ljubljana. We work with Bacillus subtilis, which is probiotic plant growth promoting uh, bacterium and commonly used uh, lab strains is lysogenic for a large uh, SP beta prophage, which belongs to so-called uh, phage regulatory switches. SP beta integrates into functional locus encoding for uh, polysaccharide biosynthesis and it, it excises itself from the host chromosome prior to the sporulation. So this phage integration and excision uh, switches the expression of host attachment gene on and off. And we accidentally discovered that prolonged sporulation selection regime imposed on SP beta lysogen promotes recombination between SP beta prophage and a foreign, a closely related phage called P3TS. Um, genomic analysis of natural uh, Bacillus subtilis isolates uh, revealed that similar recombination between uh, within the group of SP beta like phages very likely takes place in nature. And these phages reside in roughly 40% of all Bacillus septilis strains and they are extremely mosaic. Uh, we see that uh, this mosaicism matters a lot um, because lesogeny with a different but closely related SP beta variants leads to some obvious uh, phenotypic changes in the host bacterium. And currently I'm heading a project where we investigate how and why this mosaic phage regulatory switches alter individual and group level behavior of their host bacteria. Thanks, that's all from my side and I will be happy to talk to you later during the breakout rooms. Thank you, that's super cool. Um, okay, next one is Yan Bin. All right. Uh... So my name is Yan Bing Yin. Uh, so I'm a bioinformatician. So today I'm going to talk about uh, two bioinformatics softwares or tools that we developed for anti-CRISPR research. Uh, I'm going to uh, do anti-clockwise. I know I have a lot of figures here. So if you look at the left side, uh, top side, so what are anti-CRISPRs? Uh, so they are basically small protein products that are made up by phages to inhibit uh, CRISPR-Cas. Uh, uh, so this seminar paper from uh, Joseph Boundy, Dinami, and uh, other uh, published in 2013 identified the first anti-CRISPR. Uh, so uh, in 2019, uh, the same uh, group uh, in University of Toronto further characterized ACA protein to be the uh, anti-CRISPR repressor, transcription repressor of ACR uh, expression. So we have the ACR, ACA gene operon in phages and prophages. Uh, so if you look at the uh, bottom left corner, so here in uh, 2020, uh, uh, Joseph Bundy Dinami published a nature method review paper summarized uh, the applications of using anti-CRISPR to modulate uh, CRISPR-Cas uh, uh, genome editing. They also summarized the uh, molecular, molecular mechanism that ACR uh, used to inhibit CRISPR-Cas. So basically inhibit uh, uh, the uh, Cas enzyme by uh, block the D binding or block the D uh, cleavage uh, from, from Cas enzyme. Um, at the bottom middle of the table, uh, I showed that uh, uh, since 2013, uh, there are uh, right now 89 experimentally characterized ACR uh, proteins 
uh, as you see that uh, they are uh, inhibiting uh, 11 different type of CRISPR, uh, CRISPR-Cas uh, subtypes. And uh, so at the bioinformatician, uh, um, so we are interested in developing computational uh, tools to help uh, experimentalists to, to predict uh, 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 and their CRISPR automatically. So uh, what we use is the sequence features that are extracted from the experimental biologists, uh, their papers. So right now there are three, uh, there are actually four um, computational um, uh, algorithm or, or tools that, are, uh, that can do the automatic annotation or prediction of uh, anti-CRISPR. Uh, so uh, ACR Finder is the one that uh, uh, was developed by us in 2019. And there are also other tools called uh, ParCRISPR, uh, ACR Catalog, ACR Ranker. So really uh, last year we integrated three of the four tools in one uh, pipeline and identified uh, thousands of, uh, uh, we call them high confidence uh, anti-CRISPR uh, uh, ACR, ACR prompts, uh, which is in the middle of uh, the figure. So uh, if you're interested, you can go look at our website. Um, and uh, uh, if you have questions, I will be happy to answer them in the break comment. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, next up is Maria. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Maria Junkova. I work at the Joint Genome Institute at the Berkeley National Lab. And my flash talk will be about the host phage relationships in the hot spring microbial net. We often think that the phages aim to nearly eliminate their host. The fluctuating abundances of the phages in their host can be observed in longitudinal sample collections from, for example, seawater with low density of microbes. But the microbial mats are the opposite. The cells form dense biofilms, and in this picture from the cone pool hot spring, you can see that the bacteria are organized in layers, which have very different composition. Prior to other study, there have been only some laboratory experiments with pairs of biofilm forming bacteria and their phages, but nothing was known about how it works in the real environment full of previously unknown bacteria and archaea. We applied single cell genomics to link phages and their host in this compool microbial net. The experiment was based on the idea that some of the sampled microbial cells can have viruses attached to their surface or replicating in their interior. So viruses and their host would be recovered together as a pair. These pairings obtained by single cell genomics then served as backbone for mapping of the metagenomic reads from three different layers of this mat. As a result, we found a very stable ratio of genome copies of the viruses and their host across all the layers. The viruses were present only in those layers in which their hosts were present, which suggests low diffusion of viral particles across the layers. We believe that in order to be successful as a phage in this microbial mat, the phages need to piggyback the winner, which means they um, rather have a peaceful relationship with their host. I would like to discuss with you during the breakout session which relationship you probably observe in your favorite environment. Uh, thank you for attention. Thank you. Um, OK, next one is Piotr. Hello, everyone. My name is Piotr Tenecki. I'm a PhD student uh, at Białystok University of Technology in Poland. I'm also one of the co-creators of Phage AI platform, which helps you to characterize your phages in silico using machine learning. Today, I would like to um, talk about the improvement which we uh, made for life cycle classification. One of the requests uh, from the community was that uh, our current approach wasn't able to detect filamentous phages and the chronic infection. So we had to extend our training set and to totally change the co concept uh, of a methodology which we adopt for AI. And I'm grateful to inform you that it was possible to, to achieve the results. I would like to share more details about the, the approach. So um, we extended the training set with more than 300, 300 phages, chronic phages, which we extracted from public domain, but uh, as well as from the private uh, consortiums. Um, it allowed us to collect more than 60,000 uh, amino acid sequences, which we extracted with our own technology. So this is one of the novel change which we made. Uh, we are working with uh, amino acids right now, not with uh, raw sequences. So if we decided to work with amino acids, with coding sequences, we had to change also the, the way how we want to interpret the, the sequences and, and get the 
numerical vector. So we use transformer-based deep learning methodology, which is uh, one of the state-of-the-art approach, um, to be honest, for that problem. And thanks for that, uh, we were able to convert each of the amino acid sequence into the numerical vector, which contains 1,280 num numerical num numbers, which are expressing different things about the phages. One of the things which we are currently focused on is the life cycle. So if we have a vector which are defining some specifics about the phage, we can start working on downstream tasks like life cycle. So we used machine learning approach after that to train, to extend the model which we uh, shared with you before. And the results, we, we, we were able to keep the results. We have a very accurate model, more than 98% uh, on test set. And that model is going to be published soon. One other thing which I would like to share with you, this is the interactive plot, which can help you understand where your, your fetch is, what kind of position your fetch has, and uh, how similar your fetch is uh, with the other phages. So thanks for that. You can see that pink phages are represented by chronic uh, life cycle, and that feature also will be available uh, for you uh, very soon. So uh, at the end, I would like to inform you that at the end of the May, the model should be uh, released uh, on Page AI. This is a free platform. Feel free to register your account. And if you know basics of Python, you can install a package and work on your station. Thank you so much. Looking forward to testing. Thank you. Um, next one is Yuna. Hello, everyone. My name is Yuna Huang, and I'm a PhD student at Harvard University. Um, and I'm here to give a quick intro to our recent study um, about the host virus interactions in the Atacama Desert. Uh, we studied the metagenomes of the Atacama hyperarid soils um, to explore how abundant and diverse viruses are in these ecosystems, and also to understand how they interact with their hosts. Um, to give a brief background on the Atacama, it's um, one of the driest and oldest deserts on Earth and is commonly referred to as the Martian Unlocked on Earth um, because of its harsh conditions consisting of um, extreme desiccation, high temperature fluctuations, and almost sterilizing UV radiation. Only a few extremely tolerant um, microbes are found in these ecosystems, so we thought it'd be a unique um, environment for studying um, host virus interactions because the, the, of the lower abundance um, of these microbes and lower chance of encounter between viruses and bacteria and high selection between um, for both of them. In short, we detected the viral um, sequences in Atacama metagenomes and then matched them to their hosts from the same samples. And then uh, we discovered not only are, they, uh, are the viruses um, extremely uh, diverse and also abundant, but there are also um, host virus interactions across the desert um, indicating viral and or uh, microbial dispersal across um, hundreds of kilometers. We also analyzed the auxiliary genes of the um, viral genomes, and um, we discovered um, interesting um, putative um, extreme tolerance genes um, suggesting there, that there may be a mutualistic model for host virus interactions in the Atacama Desert. So we posit that these viruses likely infect their hosts um, and then take up shelter um, uh, in their hosts as lysogens or pseudolysogens, and then in turn ensure um, survival of their hosts through the expression of these um, uh, extreme tolerance features. And over time, these viruses might also play an important role in spreading extreme tolerance genes um, to uh, different microbes by transduction. This study is about to be published on um, M-Systems and the latest version is also available on um, BioArchive. So please do check it out if you're interested in, in um, host virus interactions in hyper air soils. Thank you. Great, <clears throat> thank you. Um, and last was Law. Okay, hello. Um, I'm, my name is Laura van Espa. I'm a PhD student from the KU Leuven in Belgium. And the focus of my PhD project is on the human gut virome. For this specific project, we studied the gut virome in Danish individuals. And first I generated a catalog containing all their viral genomes. And then we used this catalog uh, to characterize the gut virome in this healthy population. It was uh, dominated by phages and highly individual, which is not unsurprising. 
Um, but since we, uh, the healthy subset consisted of both children and adults, we could also look at the effect of age. So we didn't find any biologically significant differences in, for example, alpha diversity, but we did found, find out that uh, the proportion of temperate phages is lower in adults than in the children. And also we were able to identify some age associated uh, phage genomes. So two phage genomes, the orange and the pink one in the heat map were more uh, prevalent in the adults uh, than in the children. And the blue one was more prevalent in the children than in the adults. Uh, because we found quite some fate genomes that were present in a fairly large amount of the healthy Danish individuals. So uh, those in the first column of the heat map in up to a third of the Danish individuals that we studied. Uh, we wanted to know if they were quite specific for this population or whether they could be found worldwide. And for this purpose, we um, screened as arrays from other publicly available gut virome studies. The phage that was uh, obviously recovered the most uh, was uh, a cross-like phage, a green one, uh, or the green one in the heat map. And then the second most prevalent phage genome, the purple one in the heat map, uh, was a previously undescribed phage with a prevalence of 15% uh, in the SRAs. And we named it the love phage, and its genome is um, visualized at the bottom of the slide. So if you want to more, know more about this, please check out my poster or have a look at our preprint. And thank you and hope to see you in the breakout room. Thank you. And that was awesome. Thanks to all the Flash Talk presenters. Really amazing to see so much science and, and really not that easy to distill your message to under two minutes. So great work, everyone. And really, really glad that uh, you, you know, came and, and agreed to do these Flash Talks. That's awesome. Um, with that, I will hand it over back to Emily for the second main talk of this seminar. All right, thanks, Simon. And uh, thanks to all the speakers. This has been a, a great session. And to close it out, um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Rachel Whitaker, who's a professor of microbiology in the School of Molecular and Cellular Biology at the University of Illinois. And without further ado, uh, her title, uh, top title is Predicting viral uh, epidemics in microbial populations. Uh, so Rachel, all yours. And you should be able to share your screen now. Okay. All good. Okay. All right, thank you very much for this um, introduction. I'm excited to come here and talk today. Wow, that was such an amazing um, set of talks all together right away. Um, it's hard to follow and my head is spinning. Um, I'm gonna talk about something that I proposed to talk about um, way long before um, we had our own uh, pandemic. Um, so um, it seemed kind of funny when I went back um, to look at the title that I had sent in. This was the last seminar that um, workshop that got canceled um, for the, for the um, pandemic, but for me. But so it says pre predicting viral epidemics in microbial populations. Um, and I think this is important for a lot of different reasons and maybe something that people don't think about as much as our own pandemics, but um, really important for a lot of different reasons. And most of those have to do with the way um, viruses interact with their microbial hosts. We care about the microbial hosts a lot in a lot of different ways. And so understanding when or predicting when epidemics are going to wipe them out um, is important. And so um, this will help us to stabilize good microbial populations like the fermentation products where CRISPRs were first identified, wastewater treatment, healthy microbiomes, um, and maybe the symbionts that, that plant and animals depend on more generally. It also might help us understand how to destabilize bad microbial populations using phage therapy um, and immunizing against the spread of antimicrobial resistance. And since viruses have two roles, the role of 
predator or killing um, their hosts, but also the role of moving genetic material around um, as chronic and latent viruses. Um, it will help us understand epidemics of gene flow through virus infection. Um, and that can help us predict the emergence of new genotypes and phenotypes of bacteria that are um, pathogens. And also, um, as I said before, drug resistance that's encoded on viruses that spread through, the, through a population. So if we wanna predict viral um, epidemics in microbial populations, what do we look for? We can't really look obviously from with our eyes. Um, and of course the answer here is we use genomics to understand the diversity. And I'm gonna focus today on the CRISPR-Cas immunity, the CRISPR-Cas immune system, which um, is um, a adaptive immunity that's found in bacteria and archaea. And I loved the idea of the power of comparative immunology that was um, introduced by the first speaker today, because I was already had in my slides this idea of the universal principles of adaptive immunity. So um, this type of immunity, the CRISPR-Cas immunity, is different from maybe the other defense systems, um, because and more like our own adaptive immunity, um, because it encodes specificity, diversity memory, cross-reactivity, um, prevents autoimmunity, um, and has, but has similar escape um, mechanisms through mutation and uh, immune targeting through anti-CRISPRs. So um, the beauty of CRISPR is not only does it um, have some of the same features of adaptive immunity, like our own adaptive immunity, but it also can be directly linked through the sequence um, of the CRISPR arrays to the virus uh, genome. And so while the understanding the diversity and dynamics of our own immune populations is starting to become a reality with the ability to sequence um, single T cell receptor repertoires in people over time, linking that directly to what whether you're going to be immune to, um, to variants, immune escape variants of viruses is really not um, as easy as it might seem because the uh, um, epitopes are encoded in proteins that have to fit by shape with our antibodies um, and B cell receptors. And so we can't, and T cell receptors, I mean, and so we can't necessarily predict that direct link What's beautiful about CRISPRs is we can look at diversity and structure in an immune population and link it directly to which viruses it can um, it can be a, the immune repertoire to the viruses that can infect the specific host populations. And so we can learn something about diversity and structure that we can't learn yet in our own immunity. So we set out to do this initially with a simulation model um, that was based on the undirected mutation of a virus like normal viruses, coronavirus, flu virus, and also archaeal and bacterial viruses um, acquire escapes through mutation in their genomes and directed mutation or the acquisition of CRISPR spacers. So this shows you, I'm sure people know about CRISPRs now, but the way this uh, mechanism works in bacteria and archaea is that there's a um, chromosomally encoded locus in the uh, CRISPR called the CRISPR array. Um, when there's an infection, a small piece of the virus called a spacer is added, taken from the virus at the protospacer position and added to the host chromosome. Then this is transcribed so that later um, infections can specifically recognize that sequence and target viruses for degradation through the Cas system. So we have this directed muta mutation model encoded in our simulations based on what we know about the way the CRISPRs work from the amazing molecular work that's been um, ongoing um, and really, really inspiring over the over the past uh, relative five years or, or 10 years, I guess it is now. Um, we have 
um, in co so we put this all into the simulation model and then we're able to run um, and watch the evolution of viruses and their hosts over time. And our initial look at this um, described uh, some metrics for immunity that would stabilize populations, that would increase host density and diversity and decrease viral diversity um, leading to stochastic virus extinction. And those were the level of diverse based on the level of diversity that was in a host population. So we described the difference between a monoclonal um, population where there's a dominance of a single match in a population to a virus and a distributed immunity polyclonal um, population where there's lots of different matches in the host to the same virus. And we predicted that these and showed that the ones with distributed immunity with lots of different matches to the same virus would be more stable and would lead to virus extinction. What this didn't show, sorry, what this didn't show was um, the actual structure of diversity. It got to a little bit the structure of diversity, but did not include any understanding of what multiple CRISPR spacer matches would do in the same host. And you can see here that this host has a blue one and a pink one that match the dominant virus. What's the difference between having two matches and one? That's a huge difference, it turns out, and we learned that um, by extending our um, simulation model to look at the structure of diversity um, using immune CRISPR profiles in our simulations. So this was inspired um, by Shai Pilosoff and Mercedes Pascal, who have been looking at the complexity of um, all kinds of different infections, viruses and um, plasmodium malaria um, and some bacterial infections to see the imprints of selection by the immune system on the bacterial diversity, or I mean on the pathogen diversity. And because we can sequence pathogen diversity quickly and, and look, at its, um, look at its structure and because Mercedes and Shai were not scared of the complexity of the true diversity of a pathogen world, um, they were able to identify components of immune selection just by looking at its imprints on the um, pathogen diversity. They were excited about CRISPR because it lets us look at it both ways. And so they, we ran simulations in um, a more um, high throughput way and then uh, decided to look at the structure of diversity using tripartite networks. So we take our host genomes and identify its spacers, and then where those spacers in the host, in the CRISPR system, match the protospacers of the viruses, um, we link the host to the virus in terms of whether it can infect in the infection network or whether the host is immune to that virus in the immune network. And what's um, really exciting and cool about this, um, these two different types of networks is the immune network can be weighted. So if you have more matches to a single, um, if a host has more matches to a single virus, um, it has here, for example, a darker color. Um, and we, and um, it, this, this type of structure is a structure, um, nestedness structure that's in um, ecological networks known to affect the dynamics of populations. So we decided to look at this um, throughout a simulation. Here's a simulation where you, the different colors represent different CRISPR types of bacteria and, and the different colors of viruses represent different virus types. Um, you can see the number of mis mismatches I mean, the number of CRISPR spacer matches accumulating um, and changing over time. And then below you can see the um, weighted network that compares the immune structure of bacterial strains to virus strains. So as we ran these simulations, we were able to watch the um, structure change over time. And I think you'll see a very, what we think is a predictive pattern for when, we, when there's going to be an outbreak or an uh, um, epidemic. So you can see this virus epidemic here 
it's increase in the virus population. This is a lytic virus model. So there's an extreme decrease in the host population. Um, but for the most part, these walls of host diversity prevent these virus um, epidemics. So for the most part in this simulation, um, you can see this diverse wall of diversity and viruses that are just really low in numbers and um, coming and going. What during that time, we have um, very interesting structure in a very interesting structure in the virus population, which indeed is this nested structure. So during this, um, during this diverse and stable wall of the bacteria or archaea, the microbial genomes, you can see that they build, the populations build this level of high um, nestedness where there's some hosts that match all viruses. And when they match all viruses, they match them with multiple matches. So these darker colors mean multiple matches. Over time, the viruses that are matched by multiple matches go extinct and increase then relative to the rest of the population, the number of viruses that match their host by just one or zero matches. And when, you're and when the strains are matched, when enough virus strains are matched by zero or one matches, that's in a, at a time when the virus um, epidemic can happen. Escape mutations of a single mutation can accumulate and allow the virus to break out into this population um, and cause this, but this increase in virus associated with a decrease in host, which only lasts for a little while and then the diversity is rebuilt again in a different way and turns into this nested structure. So the idea is that we can look at the, um, the simulated structure and be able to predict where, uh, get a value for R0. And this is a, an R0 that we're calling the R0 mutation R0, which is the accessibility of the host population to single virus escape mutants. Single virus escape mutants are much easier to acquire than double and triple and everything gets worse because a single virus genome only needs a single mutation to escape versus two mutations. So with um, reasonable mutation rates, there's a very low likelihood you're ever gonna get two mutations. So based on the number of single mutations or zero mutations needed for infection, we were able to make a value of our knot that could predict when this virus was gonna um, break through the population. Okay, so of course that's in the simulation, but we wanted to test whether we saw this kind of structure in different populations of, um, of bacteria and archaea. And I'm gonna show you here two populations of the archaea sophilobus Icelandicus um, and its response to two different viruses. So the first one is the Yellowstone population where we took um, 36 different Icelandicus strains, as Sophilobus Icelandicus strains, isolated them, sequenced their genomes. They were all from a single time point and from three hot springs that are very close together and we think um, connected in terms of their population, so from a single population. And we, um, in comparison, took 50 Sophilobus Icelandicus strains from a very different population in Kamchatka, Russia, which we've shown to be isolated and also shown to have stable diversity within it. So this is the beautiful host, which interacts with through uh, its surface structures with the viruses. Um, and there's two different viruses that we found to be dominant in the two different populations. In the uh, Yellowstone population, we found that there's SIRVs. SIRVs are lytic viruses that kill their hosts. And the majority of the spacers in the Yellowstone population match that we could match match to SIRV populations. In um, the Kamchatka population, we found matches to a sulfalobus spindle-shaped virus, which is a chronic virus. Um, and we found no um, SIRVs and no matches to SIRV in this other population. So we isolated um, at the same time, we isolated viruses to go with our hosts. And like I said, in Yellowstone, we found dominance of the SIRVs, the lytic virus. We did find some SSVs, the chronic virus. 
while in Kamchatka, we only found SSCs, some other viruses that we think are lytic, but we don't um, necessarily have them um, uh, yet uh, characterized fully. Um, and so these are two different populations that interact with two different viruses with different lifestyles. In the Yellowstone population, we saw, surprising to me, we saw coexisting um, CRISPR diversity. And here's a map of the Yellowstone genomes. This shows you where they're infected by that SSC chronic virus. And this shows the extraordinary level of CRISPR diversity at kind of a large scale. So this doesn't show you where single spacers might change, but in general, where arrays are different, there's multiple different CRISPR arrays and they have multiple different alleles coexisting within a single population at a single time. And when we look at that and compare it to our SIRVs, we see that it has the structure that was predicted during that stable wall, um, which is a nested structure where there's some strains that match many viruses in with many spacers and other strains um, which match um, fewer viruses with fewer matches, and this stable population, this would predict a stable population if it works the way we thought it did in the simulations. In Kamchatka, we saw also saw weighted nestedness against our uh, chronic viruses, but it was a more sparse immune um, immune network with. Um, many more single or zero matches. Um, and so this predicts that maybe the chronic virus can um, emerge in this population. We weren't able to test that over time. We're planning to test in Yellowstone over time, um, whether our predictions, whether that diversity is um, consistent and whether we can catch at least a changeover in the alleles that are present based on a, vir a lytic virus epidemic. We can't do that in Kamchatka because it's so far away and difficult to study. So we decided to look at it in experimentally in the lab and built a system where we could take our virus, our chronic infected virus, and um, compete it with and in culture with a CRISPR immune or non-immune strain. The virus we used was Sulfolobus uh, spindle-shaped virus, SSV9, which is also isolated from Kamchatka um, and has a core genome of about 17 KB um, that's shared with most of the other SSVs. We can infect um, immune deficient strains that we genetically engineer with this virus. And in general, the, um, when we do an initial infection, the majority of the cells die but then by the end of a, an ongoing infection, uh, um, ongoing growth, we see the population recover and almost 100% of the cells in the recovered populations are infected. So even though we infected with a very low MOI, we got 100% infected after this um, initial die off of the uninfected cells. So we isolated this chronically infected cell from this CRISPR immune deficient, strain um, and showed that it has a little bit of a cost to, to be infected and then competed it against our immune and, um, and immune deficient strains. And what we found was what I'm uh, kind of a curveball here was that um, the whole dynamic is not necessarily determined by um, CRISPR-Cas immunity because the, CRISP, the SSV infected cell actually kills uninfected cells. So we have in this um, experiment that is competing uninfected cells with immune, you see that they persist over time together. But if the virus infected cells are included and competed with the immune, you see the immune cells um, actually going away and we've shown that they're dying when they're um, in culture with the infected cells. Um, this can happen at a very low invade, uh, cells that are infected can inv invade at a very low, from a very low number for, for when they're rare, um, which tells us that there's a real advantage to being infected with SSV9 um, in competition with immune strains in, um, in a hot spring population. 
So we extended this um, to, uh, to look at our uh, Yellowstone SSV viruses and other Kamchatka viruses and found that all of the ones, most of the ones that we tested um, actually do have this killing phenotype. Um, and so there's the um, SSV11, which is from Yellowstone. It um, kills its host, its uh, immune cells very rapidly. Um, the other cells, um, also do, except for SSV14, um, which does not um, make the uh, protein toxin that we've identified now. So that all makes sense. But viruses do, in many different viruses, encode this killing phenotype. The chronic viruses encode this killing phenotype, which is going to skew the immune population by killing uninfected cells. So where this leads us is that um, in putting these pieces together is that where we thought we could maybe predict epidemics in the microbial world using CRISPRs, of course we can't. And instead we need to take into account the latent and, cr lytic, uh, latent and chronic um, viruses that are at, at, that, at present in the same populations coexisting with CRISPR immunity and lytic viruses. And so I think um, our worldview of viruses is changing to include them along this continuum of symbiosis from antagonistic to mutualistic. And if we include the mutualistic viruses that are encoded in the genomes of bacteria and archaea, we're gonna start to get a much better understanding on the way um, gene flow happens in bacteria that we care about. And we're trying to look at this now in our Yellowstone population where we can measure the dynamics over time by not only looking at CRISPR, CRISPR diversity and, vi and lytic virus, SIRV virus diversity, but also including the impacts of this uh, chronic virus that's a mutualist with the same host and kills um, off immune cells. So with that, I'm gonna finish up. I want to um, highlight that this is the work uh, ongoing in my lab over many years. Um, it's been funded by the NSF, the uh, Paul Allen Foundation, and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation currently. Um, it, it's uh, based on a strong collaboration that I have with Mercedes Pascal and Shai Pilisoff. Um, and most of the work I showed you today was experimental work done um, by San Samantha Dwarf, who recently graduated from my lab, and John Snyder, who, who's just beginning. Um, so with that, I'll finish up and take any questions if you have them. All right, fantastic. Thanks so much. That was a really great talk. Um, so for those of you who have questions, um, please add them to the Q&A. Um, so we already have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, so the first one is, uh, thank you, Dr. Whitaker, for a great presentation. Uh, do you know how frequent is the horizontal CRISPR gene transfer among bacteria in the same environment such as Yellowstone? So we've looked at um, the recombination um, and movement of CRISPR arrays in the archaea that live in the hot springs, and we're looking at it now in bacteria and a couple of other systems, including Pseudomonas originosa, which has active um, CRISPR systems. And we know that the arrays are mobile. Um, we've seen mostly the mobility of the complete array, so you're able to switch immunity around an, an immune repertoire around, um, and they're in hyper -recomb recombining regions of the genome when we look in natural populations, um, and so they're probably recombinants that are under selection. Um, so yes, the arrays are horizontally transferred. That is not in our model, although we we want to think about including it because it's probably a really important piece of the puzzle. Great, thanks. So we have another uh, question from one of the panelists. Um, so do the simulations provide a sense for the time frame of these viral epidemics in microbial populations? And are these happening on the time scales of hours or days or weeks? That's a great, great question. And we're really trying to figure this out now. Um, when we looked at this in some of the previous simulations that weren't as flexible and didn't allow as many, um, as many spacers and protospacers, it was very unpredictable. 
Um, and going forward, we now know a little bit more about what to look for. And we think it's gonna be something about the length of the immune memory uh, relative to the mutation rates that um, that virus will have. But there's, a, you know, of course, the failure rate of CRISPR is not really understood or well known. Um, there's many other things that can play into this. And I think we just have to learn a little more about the specific viruses and how they interact with the CRISPRs. But this gives us a model in which we can put those parameters to try to predict for a specific bacteria and virus or archaea and virus what will happen, um, maybe, if, if, if all goes well. Great, thanks. We have a couple more uh, questions coming in. So the next one is, uh, great talk. How do you think primed adaptation factors into the modeling outbreaks stories? So should it make outbreaks less likely? Yes, I think that's a really interesting piece. And some of this we started thinking about when we look, were looking at priming in Pseudomonas and looking for it in Sophilobus. And we saw um, different patterns with different viruses, um, but um, definitely many examples of multiple matches. Um, and some of them, sometimes they look like primed matches and sometimes they look like repeat infections. Um, I think it's going to be a big piece of it because if you get multiple matches, you're much more stable. Um, and then what happens is the viruses that are matched multiply are going to go extinct. And the leftover viruses that are not matched, that are different, are going to have a chance to invade that population. So that's what leads to this second part of the structure, I think, that I didn't talk about, which is modularity in the infection network. So there's modularity in the infection network and nestedness in the immune network, which together build the dynamic. So they're, um, they're diversifying, the viruses are diversifying away from each other to share fewer matches because multiply matched hosts are gonna be impossible to acquire a mutation through one round of, or, for low probability you require one round of mutation, uh, one mutation in one round of infection. Great, thanks. And I think we'll have uh, one last question before the breakouts. Um, and that is, uh, could the SSVs also carry anti-CRISPRs? They could carry anti-CRISPRs. Um, we've shown really that this virus, the SSV that we've worked on and the other viruses that we have have do not encode um, anti-CRISPRs that um, match the CRISPR system of the host that we work on because we have um, the CRISPR, we have tested what happens um, when you delete the CRISPRs and you need the CRISPRs in order to have immunity. Um, that doesn't mean they don't exist in others. There's a huge diversity of CRISPR systems, even within the Kamchatka population, the castings vary a lot. And we don't know why that is, but I've always thought it would be because of anti-CRISPRs, but we don't have any evidence of anti-CRISPRs right now. All right, great. Well, thank you so much again. That was wonderful. And I think we have um, some time for the breakouts and I'll hand it uh, over to Simon. Thank you again. Thank you. Let me just share my last slide and uh, thank all the speakers and everyone for attending. This was a great session again today. Um, a quick reminder that we have the last seminar of this VEGA 2021 series next week. And in the meantime, if you want to chat more about everything you just heard and, and discuss with the speaker, this is the link that you also got in, in your email to join the breakout session. Thank you.